Uh, our next witness is uh, John uh, Seddon, who's an occupational psychologist and managing director of a consultancy um, uh, that helps organisations move from a command and control design towards a systems design. Uh, well, to start with, what on earth does that mean? Well, most organisations are designed as top-down functional hierarchies, and we think we should separate decision-making from work, and managers make decisions, and the workers do the work. And managers make the decisions with things like budgets, targets. In service organisations, things like service-level agreements, and that's the lingua franca of management. Now, I... I, I uh, and you actually, sorry to interrupt. You've got you've got a rather wonderful little quote about NHS targets that uh, rather illustrates this. Well, you? perhaps you could tell me what it is. Oh, all right. It's something <laughs> about uh, the posture that staff uh, that staff have when they're uh, when they're relating to targets and. Uh, that's your, what Jack Welsh talks about. Uh, Jack Welsh's. It's not mine. It's Jack Welsh's. He said, you know, when you run your organisation from the top down, you have everybody's face looking up towards the hierarchy and their bottoms towards, in this case, the patient. Okay, uh, Michael Patelum. So. Are you saying, for example, that in the case of mid-staffs, which we have been talking about, that, that targets are essentially to blame? Uh, one of the causes. I mean, you know, the three... If you read the Robert Francis report, and in fact this is common across the NHS, uh, we're obsessed with form-filling, uh, target tree, uh, and also cost management. I'm, I, I'm, I'm sure we are, and I'm sure those are very, very bad things, but does it, in, does it really explain, you know, nurses uh, allowing patients to dehydrate to death or consultants wandering through wars which must have stunk of urine and faeces no, well, does it uh, does it explain that well or? not not of itself but you know you need to understand that these things together create a culture of fear uh, a culture of fear driven through a hierarchy which would then become a culture that is concerned more about how you're seen by the hierarchy than you are uh, being concerned for the patient i know it's extraordinary i would have thought a culture of fear B B might, might have been quite helpful actually i mean if you know if these people had feared some consequences i mean they were obviously right not to fear any consequences because there haven't been any consequences but w wouldn't fear have been quite a handy thing i doubt it you know i think people uh, i think people like to go to work to do a good job i think they'd rather be inspired uh, to do good things and to do that you need different kinds of measures uh, well i i find common ground with you there i'm sure they want to be inspired should be inspired they should be led as well but I'm blamed if I see why a target gets in the way of being inspired or being led. Well, it's very simple. A target's an arbitrary measure. Uh, and if you ever impose an arbitrary measure down a hierarchy, there's only three things that people can do. The first is, and this is the thing you'd hope they do, is find a better method. Uh, the, otherwise, they can cheat the numbers or distort the system. But, but targets aren't necessarily arbitrary. I mean, you, you and I decide to build a tunnel together, and we have a target of uh, finishing it by Christmas. This seems to me jolly helpful target you and i both know what we're trying to do and therefore we go to work together with, with a common set of objectives and it'd, it's be, jolly useful. and it'd be a good idea michael if we built a few tunnels together so we'd know whether or not <laughs> no, but, but come to the feasible. point why, why, is, me, why is a target but, a bad thing well, it, me, well, it, it, well, it, it establishes common ground well, in me, our endeavor okay let me give you an, a, a different example you know uh, the, there's uh, portsmouth city housing repairs they look after social housing they do repairs uh, they now deliver repairs to tenants on the day at the time a tenant's want now if bt could do that we'd all cheer okay and they've achieved that result at half the original cost now if before they started a program of change to do that that had been set as a target everybody would have laughed so there's another issue with the target it can limit improvement yeah i see that it can but i don't see why it also can't be very helpful i mean if, if you and i are in a service business and we have a target to pick up the phone before it rings three times Jolly good, we know what we're trying to do. Don't, don't you think it'd be more important that we actually provide the answer that the person wants when we pick it up? Uh, well, I think the two might go hand in hand. I mean, <laughs> well, why, why does everything have to be an alternative to the other? Uh, well, they, they don't. But, you know, the interesting thing is that people are obsessed with things like that, how quickly you pick up the phone and so on, and that's not the issue in service design. Go to Mali. Uh, you seem to say, I think, that, pe that targets disincentivise people because people are intrinsically demotivated to do a good job is that right they d d yes that's right yes uh, that's correct so well, you, do, do you see people as fundamentally good humans as fundamentally good yes yes and i would say that the i mean the system in the nhs it, uh, fun, <laughs> fundamentally encourages poor behavior i mean as it does with financial services though. but it's not a bit naive to suggest that people are fundamentally good but only do bad things because of form filling 
uh, well, no, I mean psychologists. When you take, take financial services, you know, the, the, the major problem there, which was actually in the open, it was, wasn't hidden away, uh, was incentives. Now, one of the things that we know about incentives is whenever you create a contingent incentive, do this to get that, you take the value out of the work. I mean, to use Socrates' own label, they, people become enslaved to their appetites. Sure, but... Now, we all saw that happening in the city. But isn't, this, isn't the idea that, that people, human nature, is fundamentally good, isn't that as naive as the notion that human nature is fundamentally bad? Isn't that we have dispositions to do both, and, and therefore it, we're neither fundamentally good nor fundamentally bad? Uh, I think that's fair. I mean, I think David Hume set out the idea that we should all be treated as though we're fundamentally bad. Uh, but what I'm trying to argue is it's the system that has the biggest impact on behaviour. So uh, it's quite extraordinary how good you take honest God-fearing people off the street, put them in a building, call it an organisation, you get the most extraordinary behaviour. <laughs> so you are um, uh, you, you, you're, you're opposed to targets, but are you opposed to rules, regulations? Well, well, regulations, that's a bit... I mean, you know, every European country has a better regulation task force. That's interesting, isn't it? Um, and uh, I, I, I'm talking in London next Monday uh, to a, a group on regulation, giving lots of examples of how regulations made performance worse, made organisations worse. And this is part of, the, part of the common disease, that regulators believe in a lot of the ideology uh, that ministers believe in that's driving, for example, the public sector. But isn't part of civilization culture developing ourselves and so on whatever you want to call it isn't part of that ourselves developing rules yes to 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 to, to um, shape how we behave how we act towards others how we uh, are moral and therefore rules and regulations become important in that context do they not well yes but it'd be said earlier on this program the more important thing is that we as individuals develop those rules understand those rules operate with those rules you know we, it's, it's gone we've gone to a pretty dim place and we've got to have them regulated and imposed upon us especially when you think about things like dignity sure so your argument is not that rules are wrong or regulations wrong or even targets are wrong but that they're imposed by someone outside us and we do not create them ourselves well, it's beyond that because the nature of an arbitrary measure is it will always distort a system you know whereas what you need is measures that help you understand and improve performance use where the work's done you know that that then gives you intrinsic motivation which is the engine of pride <laughs> nice note to end on john john Seddon, thank you thank you very much indeed Uh, um, uh, Canon uh, John Seddon, the second uh, second witness. Uh, I, I mean, he just reckoned all these uh, uh, measures were, were arbitrary and actually just led to people cheating, cheating the numbers or or distorting uh, distorting the system, and that humans were fundamentally good. Well, when I questioned him on, him on that, he, he started by saying humans are fundamentally good, and I think he backtracked on that um, to a point where, where I would agree with him that, that we ha we are neither fundamentally good nor fundamentally bad, but have dispositions to to be both. And the, his final point, which was that the real problem uh, is that um, uh, it's not rules and regulations or even targets, but rules and regulations and targets that are imposed from the outside, uh, so they, they they become almost meaningless to us. I think that was 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 an important point to make. Uh, but uh, I mean, his point that uh, that people would rather be inspired and led than uh, than than be given a load of targets to aim for. Um, a bit Panglossian, perhaps? Well, I mean, there was a certain idealism. I think there's a yeah. certain real truth to it. I think that what, what we've got to recognise is one of the things that flowed, I think, throughout the discussion is, you know, if we've got this invisible cloak, is it always assumed that when we've got this invisible cloak that we're going to be kind of doing terrible things, abusing each other, stealing, raping, murdering? I mean, there's a danger with that, of course, that you have to have surveillance society of everything, because if you don't... So I thought what he was good at was saying, these things have to be felt intrinsic and that actually maybe people can be trusted to get on with things otherwise you institutionalize mistrust and in the end you know there's that basically you you'll never let anyone be free you see michael do you think uh, sorry to interrupt you there but uh, michael do you think dr o'neill's uh, uh, almost absolute distinction between individual morality and sort of collective societal rules was a useful one uh, I didn't think he made an absolute distinction. I think he said that we needed to distinguish between the two, mm. uh, and and so we do. Um, I, I was arguing. Can I just go back to John Seddon a moment? I was mm. arguing against John Seddon. 
but actually I thought he was a, a very good witness. Mm, uh, he, he said that systems fundamentally encourage bad behaviour. I mean, if I could introduce another example, I, mean, I think the system, for example, in the House of Commons sort of encouraged a position where we we hung our ethics on a peg outside the door before we went in there. I'm talking here about the MPs' expenses scandal and so on. Or a, 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 another institution which with which I was familiar in my political career, the army. I mean, the army... The army is um, dependent on leadership. I don't think it is dependent on targets. I don't think the target is, you know, how many Afghans except, can we... Except in the literal sense. Uh, my, my <laughs> except in the literal sense.